Welcome to In the Name of the Law with your host, Lisa Speaker from Speaker Law Firm. Joining her today is Stephen Sinus from Sinus Dramus Law Firm, along with Mary Chartier and Takura Niamfakusa from Chartier Niamfakusa PLC. Now let's discuss some remarkable stories and real cases. Welcome to In the Name of the Law, a legal talk show about real people and real cases. Today's episode, we're going to talk about personal protection orders in divorce cases, how to pursue a wrongful death cases, and a success story after a man got out of prison. In the Name of Criminal Defense On this episode of In the Name of the Law, criminal defense attorneys Mary Chartier and Takura Nyampakudsta of Chartier Nyampakudsta are joined by Miracle McClown, who is now a successful business owner. Miracle was serving a 20-year federal prison sentence for drug conspiracy until President Barack Obama reduced his sentence in 2017. Welcome, everyone. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Lisa. Now, Mary and Takura, I heard your firm had a big federal not guilty verdict recently. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Appreciate that. Miracle, I understand you wrote the former president 50 times and got turned down twice. Tell us about yes. why you kept writing after you were turned down the first time. Uh, it was just the ambition of freedom. You know, I, uh, I really feel like I deserve it. To be out, to be cut, to be honest, I felt like my uh, my sentence was a really bad much for um, when I had committed the crime of committing. And I just kept writing. I just kept writing. Um, I was told a few times that after one denial that you couldn't uh, put in clemency anymore. So that's what started the letters and just kept writing letters. And then I started putting back in clemency and denied again, then put in clemency again. And the third time was the charm for me. So just the ambition of freedom. Mm-hmm. Right. Now, I, I can only imagine how it felt, but could you tell us in your own words, when, when you received the news, how, how can you describe that feeling? Oh, the feeling was wonderful, feeling like no other. Um, I felt that I actually, to be honest, I, I believe it was just the feeling of God just assuring me that I was okay. You know, I... Um, it was just an overjoying feeling, you know. Like I explained, I, I remember looking at the TV and they had did the clemency of 350 people on CNN. And I just went to my room. I remember I was hurt by it, dropped to my knees praying because I couldn't believe that he had did 350 people and it was probably his last time doing clemency. And later on, maybe two, three hours later, they called me to the warden office and uh, I was actually one of those 350 people so it kind of just it was just an overjoying feeling for me just an overjoying feeling I, a feeling that I'll never forget a feeling that I always I yarn for every day because <laughs> that was the feeling of God yeah well you've really made the most of your opportunity to be released because as Lisa said you have a very successful business you make pocketbooks and purses and tote bags and luggage and just amazing leather work. And this is my home shopping network moment because I actually have one of your bags. So I want to show it. I get so many compliments on that. Great. I mean, it's the handcrafting is amazing. It's so great. They're gorgeous. And Takura actually is so jealous of my bag. I know you're starting a men's line that's coming out. And Takura, like he was feeling it and touching it right. and he was stroking my bag. I actually like, pull it back from him. But tell us the name of your the name of your business and what the significance of that is for you. Uh, the name of my business is 111. 111leather.com is the website. That's the number one. Spell out 11leather.com. And um, it's just, it's a business that started, like I said, um, I developed a craft in prison. And for me to come home and turn something just negative to a positive for me, it became my passion. So I started just doing bags for family and, um, I came up with the name of 111 because I just really believe in, it really stands for uh, angelical numbers where you're leaving your past and stepping forward to a better future. So that, that came in and I was just big, big on God where I 
kind of broke it down in Trinity form of like one, like one eleven meaning one love, one power, and one God. Because I really believe like where you find love, you find the power in God. So that's where the whole name came from about one eleven, and that's where the business came from. Where I started from my craft from prison, and um, come out to be doing well. Just open my website up for the women's collection, and this Friday. I'll be open up for the men's collection. So well, we know the very first customer you're going to have is Takura because everyone who ever sees Takura knows that he carries what we affectionately call a purse, which is a men's purse. And he has way more stuff in it than I do, right? And so, but did you know, so this was not a hobby that you had before you went to prison. It sounds like this was a class that you took and then you realized how talented you were. Right, right. I was always into fashion. I was doing like different clothes and things. But when I was in prison, I had a chance to get into a leather class. It was kind of hard to get into, but if they found that you were real serious, that you wanted to get into it, they would uh, let you into the class. I started off making belts and like little bracelets. And then it was a person who introduced me about purses and he gave me the basic of purses and how to make it. And me being into fashion, I think I just kind of took that creativity to another place and I started making my own designs and started bettering my craft at it. And before I knew it, you know, I had my passion and that's where I developed that. And so I'm very proud of that. I'm very proud that I could be able to do something like that coming from prison to bring out to the world. And, you know, I love the way it's accepted and, and supported, like, you know, so just let me know that I'm doing the right thing. So, yeah, it was, um, that's that's very much how it all got started. Like I never I never done a purse before. I learned how to do a purse and I went on to doing it all my own way, you know. And um shout out to the guy, man. I never forget Rodriguez, man. He was like 65 years old, a Mexican guy who really showed me the basics of it. So that's where it well, you, you are talented. And I think I told you before the show started, I'm really hard on purses. They always seem yeah. to like break and fray. And this one is great. It, does, it looks yeah. like it's brand new. And so for right. me, that's like a huge, the craftsmanship is great. Right, right. And, I, and I, I'm glad to do something like this. And, it's, and what, what, what most of part about it, like, you know, I always say, um, you know, bless be and uh, glory to the giver than the gift, you know. So I do honor to God about it. And like be able to show men who came from different prisons and came from different lives that you can change. And that's that's the most joy about this that I'm doing more than even just the craft and people and the support. It's the, it's the support of just knowing that a person can change and giving a person another chance. So that's where the real joy comes from though, to be honest. And the craft is just something that just I've took is on <laughs> and I'm, I'm loving it, you know, and I'm thankful for, for everyone who supports me. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, many people who've watched our show know that we talk about some changes we think should be made to the criminal prosecution system. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, many nonviolent offenders are serving very lengthy sentences because of mandatory minimums. What do you right. think about doing away with those? And do you think that would make the community safer or endanger people if we did away with mandatory minimums? Uh, me, honestly, I was a person under mandatory minimum. So that's very personal to me. It was different laws that passed that just didn't affect me because of my mandatory minimum. I believe that is it's, that's a harsh that's a harsh penalty for someone, especially for a nonviolent defender to be getting a mandatory ten years and twenty years because people do change. You know, I think it's more of like they should become more of rehabilitation type of program than those type of sentences, and that's what I believe in. You know, that's that's very much what I believe in. More than mandatory, it should be more rehabilitation where people are really building persons up to change to be another person because people change and that's the and that's the thing you know so you're the perfect I, example of that i mean you're you're really the perfect example of that and you're right. on the show but we could have thousands of other people who have maybe not been as successful as you with your business but also have shown that they have been rehabilitated and they don't need to serve those really lengthy prison sentences i know we love talking to you. We could talk to you for hours. We're going to have yeah. you on our podcast, Constitutional Defenders. And thank you yeah. so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Miracle. Thank you, Great Miracle.
In the Name of Criminal Defense is brought to you by Chartier Niam Fakusa PLC. In the Name of Family Law. I have with me attorney Doug Meeks. He's a family law attorney in Grand Rapids with the firm McMeeks Law. Welcome, Doug. Thank you, Lisa. Well, today we're going to be talking about an interesting topic that really affects a lot of parents who are beginning with a custody case or a divorce case. And it, it's called varying things depending on what county you're in. I refer to it as conciliation because that's the term we used to use in Ingham County, but some counties refer to it as investigation or uh, FOC caseworker, but it's all a part of a process at the front of court. And I would love for you to help us understand what that process is, and then we're gonna talk a lot about the, the pros and cons of, of the process. Well, great. Um, the process really is the, the initiation of uh, the custody portion of a case. When you first initiate, you go to the friend of the court, and at the friend of the court, this is the first time you're going to be able to meet with someone to try to work out some kind of custody or how family parenting time will occur during that period of time uh, prior. And they usually call it a temporary uh, order. Prior to getting in front of a judge, right? Correct. Yeah. Or a referee, depending right. on the circumstances in the county that you're in. And, and the important point is that the person you're meeting with, whatever the title of the process is called, they are not attorneys, right? They're just trying to help the family reach like an agreement about what their life is going to look like in the interim? That's correct. And, and you, usually the friend of the court staff are not attorneys. Um, usually those would be referees uh, within within the county. But usually you're just meeting with someone and you're trying to work out some kind of agreement between you and your spouse uh, or sig uh, significant other regarding how the kids are going to be uh, handled during the interim period. So I really want to talk about what parents should know about before they go into this process. And first, let's start by uh, telling me, if you could, what when it works, when does this system work really well for parents? Well, it works really well when you can co-parent and when you're putting your child first. And if you're, if you are two parents that are capable of putting your children first um, without having uh, any major issues, then facilitative um, mediation or concili conciliation works very beneficially. Um, the problem is that when you don't uh, have that circumstance or uh, when there is an uneven uh, amount of uh, uh, control in, in the family, uh, sometimes that then it's not very beneficial for for those uh, litigants that are coming in. So what what kind of problems should a parent be aware of before they go into the process if they're not if they know they're going to have a situation where like you said it works well if both parents are willing to co-parent. So even if you're willing to co-parent, if the other parent's not then you know it's going to be a different ball game. So tell us about some of the problems that can arise. If you're in a relationship where there's been uh, you don't have a lot of control or there's been a lot of fighting um, where you can't can't reach an ag agreement, uh, those are such situ situations that it might benefit you to have an attorney present. Um, a, a lot of uh, domestic violence issues; those those are issues that uh, are screened during this facilitative mediation. They, it's something that the friend of the court will do to try to make a determination as to whether or not uh, there's an imbalance in power. If the screening reveals that there's domestic abuse, does that mean they will not go to this through this conciliation? or investigation process? Well, that's a great question. And um, that's what I think the intent of the law was or the intent of uh, having uh, a screening done. But too often in these circumstances, you have individuals that are asked, uh, usually point blank, Are you? do you think you're capable of having a conversation today about your children? And most people want uh, to have some comfort as to what's gonna happen in the meantime uh, with their children. And so they usually will say, yes, you know, I think I can, I can have it. But that doesn't mean that there's not an influence uh, being asserted over them. And so uh, I think it's very important for whoever uh, is working with them at the front of the court to recognize that. And, and 
I think parents are allowed to, I, I'm going to use the term opt out, but they don't have to use the investigation process. There's a, a procedure to get out of it if they want to go to, but it might delay them getting a temporary order to, so they can know a parenting time schedule, right? Well, um, so usually uh, you're going to receive something from the court saying, hey, I want to schedule this information gathering uh, process. And it's very cordial and it's like, let's try to work together and facilitate uh, a, a uh, beneficial uh, child custody uh, situation during the interim. And so um, you have that coming in and, and uh, you know, it just, it depends on, on how that comes in. But the problem that really relates is that you're going to have to show up. And um, certain counties here in the, the tri-county area, uh, Clinton County, if you have two attorneys on the side, you can go directly to the referee. And that might be very beneficial for you for evidence, for evidence purposes. And I say that because too often when you're uh, not an attorney and uh, you'll go in and they'll have a conversation and that conversation leads to things that might not uh, be brought in uh, during uh, the actual trial or a hearing regarding um, that. And so uh, many times you get down these uh, into situations that you're discussing regarding custody matters that- that, uh, that maybe shouldn't be seen by a judge down the road. So like, I think what you're referencing might be is like if there's what, like a, a CPS report or if there's been a, a a police report for, let's just say, you know, do you, do you, driving while intoxicated or something like that, things that might come out during that investigation that really would not be admissible in front of the judge without more are being put into like a written document. Correct. Describing them, right? Right. So one, another thing, you, you've shared with me some situations where you go through the process, the, or the, the, the parent has gone through the process without an attorney often, and they come out of it with the, with the parenting time schedule and that sounds all fine and good, but you've expressed, you know, some situations that you've observed about what happens next after getting this, what, what was thought to be a very temporary situation. Right. A lot of times I'll have clients that come to my office and they're like, okay, well, I agreed to uh, a 50-50 split or a, par a parenting time during the, you know, during this conference, but that's not what I think is in my child's best interest or I don't think, uh, and I believed it was a temporary order. Well, a lot of times uh, you have to watch it because it can be a minefield out there because um, what the court will look at is the established custodial environment of the child. And early on uh, when you're together, um, that might be established more with one parent than the other, even though uh, you're living under the same household. One parent might be more active in the child's life. He might, uh, you know, attend all of the school events and, and, uh, and might, it might be their role in the relationship um, more, uh, more than the other side. And so sometimes the custodial environment will be uh, with one parent um, more than the other. Well, what happens is you go to these facilitative uh, mediations or conciliations and, um, you know, you work out an agreement, you're trying to work, you're trying to be uh, positive and upbeat about what the circumstance is going to occur and what the next five or six months are going to look like. And you walk yourself into an agreement that's 50-50 uh, parenting time. And during that period of time, the established custodial environment starts to change. And so that can affect the uh, the level of evidence that's necessary or the standard that's necessary in order to to change uh, to change it back to to what it was before. Right. When you were living in the same house where one parent was the primary caretaker. Right. And so the, the risk is that the judge after I mean, sometimes it takes a year to get to the judge. Right. So during that whole time, you're in this temporary, you were being, you're doing the right thing by agreeing, coming up with an agreement to have a temporary order, but then it might end up being used against you. Backfiring, at the end of the day, yes. Right? Yeah. And that happens quite regularly um, during these circumstances that, and then the order that you're getting is rubber stamped or stamped right. by the judge because right. the kids have been doing that for right. the last year. Well, thank you, Doug. This was really helpful. Thank you. Okay. In the Name of Family Law is brought to you by Speaker Law Firm. Go to WLAJ.com for more information on today's topics and to view other In the Name of the Law episodes.
in the name of personal injury law. We often hear about attorneys handling wrongful death cases, but people really don't understand what's involved with a wrongful death, death case and how they're handled. So today I have with me attorney Steve Sinus. He's a partner at the Sinus Draymond Law Firm doing personal injury law. Welcome, Steve. Thanks for having me. So first question for you is, how, who can pursue a wrongful death case? Whenever you have a death, you obviously have a huge loss. Uh, but the wrongful death statute here in Michigan is a specific statute that provides a family the right to pursue a wrongful death action if there would have been an underlying personal injury case. So if there's an auto negligence case, if there's a medical malpractice case, if there's a premises liability case, any of those situations that leads to someone's death couldn't give rise to an action under the Michigan wrongful death statute. So who can pursue a wrongful death case in Michigan? In order to pursue a wrongful death case, you first have to open an estate in the name of the, the decedent, and that has to occur through the probate court. So there's a process to open the estate that the family must get underway. And in opening the estate, you have to decide who will be appointed personal representative of the estate. Uh, when the family can agree on the person who should be appointed that personal representative, it's an easy process. Uh, there can be disputes about which family member serves that role, but the person who becomes personal representative then has the authority to hire legal counsel to pursue a wrongful death case and also has the authority to settle the case. Now, the case is subject to the probate court's supervision and approval. So if you have the wrongful death case pending in another court, in order to get approval of the settlement, you have to go to the probate court and seek its approval. And then it also has to approve how any proceeds from the settlement would be distributed between the family members. So who is the person that's usually picked to be the personal representative, the one that's actually going to be pursuing the wrongful death case? There are oftentimes families who just agree that a certain family member is in the best position to be the personal representative. Uh, but like I said, if there are disputes along the way, uh, the court will ultimately make the decision about what family member is best suited to serve as personal representative. So what damages are recoverable in Michigan if you have a wrongful death case that's successful? The damages uh, include compensating certain family members for their loss of society and companionship with the decedent. Uh, that includes the person's spouse, their children, their brothers and sisters, their parents, and their grandparents. Uh, and when it comes to their right to recover these damages, each person's relationship with the decedent needs to be analyzed and considered. Uh, if they have a very close relationship, uh, their right to uh, damages may be greater than a family member who wasn't that close with the person. So every time you have a wrongful death case, you need to assess the relationships with uh, the decedent and decide what is the way to allocate the proceeds from the settlement between the family members. Uh, and so that's part of these cases. And then there's also the economic damage side. And that's where you have the dependents such as children or the spouse claiming the loss of uh, economic support to the household in the form of income, uh, other services to the household. Uh, there can be various expenses and, and economic damages that can be pursued in a wrongful death case. I should also note that the uh, underlying type of case, whether it's an auto case or a medical malpractice case, uh, it can affect the types and ranges of damages that can actually be recovered in a wrongful death case. Okay. And what parties can be sued for wrongful death? The parties that can be sued for wrongful death are the parties that somehow contributed to the, the wrongful conduct that led to the person's injuries and or death. And when it comes down to the assessment, it depends on what you're talking about. If you're dealing with a motor vehicle crash, you're talking about whether the driver was negligent and how they operated the vehicle. Uh, but also in that context, uh, the owner of the motor vehicle can be held liable. And if the at-fault driver was operating the vehicle in the scope of his or her employment, her employer can be held liable. Uh, so you have to look at the underlying case and decide who could be held liable under that type of case. And then those are the defendants that would also be subject to the wrongful death case. So how long does a family have to file a wrongful death case in Michigan? It's typically governed by the statute of limitations that applies to the underlying claim. So if it's an auto negligence case, you have three years. Uh, medical malpractice, it, there's a two-year statute of limitations with some other nuances to it. Uh, premises liability, there's three years. So you look at the underlying cause of action 
And then there can also be an extension of that statute of limitations depending on when the death occurs and when the personal representative is appointed. But all families should understand there is a statute of limitations and you should look into your rights sooner than later. For wrongful death cases involving motor vehicle crashes, how are they different than other types of wrongful death cases? In, that, in a situation where you have a person who was killed as a result of a motor vehicle crash, uh, the, the crash will be governed by the Michigan Auto No-Fault Insurance Law. And so the wrongful death case then has to be worked through uh, as a case under the Michigan No-Fault Insurance Law with the wrongful death statute being considered, but it ultimately turns into a case where you have to decide what the person could recover under the Michigan No-Fault Insurance Law and then decide how uh, the wrongful death statute also allows other rights to damages and there can be some nuances to that. So when you're dealing with an auto crash involving a death, you have to be both aware of the no-fault insurance law and the Michigan wrongful death statute. So can you tell us what the typical timeline is for a Michigan wrongful death case? A, a timeline for a wrongful death case uh, is very much affected by the facts and circumstances of the case. If there are disputes over negligence and who was at fault for the crash, uh, there can be um, oftentimes a reason to litigate sooner than later, and that litigation may be more contentious. If the underlying conduct is obviously negligent and the parties know that there is going to be liability, there can be more of an effort to try to resolve the case before a lawsuit's filed. Uh, that process can sometimes take a, a long time in and of itself, uh, but often can lead to a settlement without uh, unnecessarily contentious and lengthy litigation. So. The ultimate answer is that it varies on the case and the circumstances of the case, uh, but families should expect that if negligence is being fought over, they're probably in for a process uh, in the courts that could take up to a year or two years to, to reach finality. And folks need an attorney to help them you know, through this process and understand what they're facing. Yes, I would tell any family member or friend to get an attorney because you are dealing with complex issues and legal standards that need to be followed. Uh, so there's a lot to think about, and you also don't want to stress about it while you're grieving over the loss of a yeah. loved one. All right. Well, thank you, Steve. Thank you. In the Name of Personal Injury Law is brought to you by the Sinus Dramus Law Firm. Thank you for watching In the Name of the Law. We'll see you next week. Thank you for joining us today for In the Name of the Law. Please go to WLAJ.com for more information on today's topics. And please join us next week for another informative show.